Hi, I'm Rich Miller. At Virtua, we believe citizens need to be informed about the important healthcare issues affecting their lives. That's why we're proud to support healthcare programming produced by the Caucus Educational Corporation and their partners in public television. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, Health Republic Insurance of New Jersey, Qualcare Inc., a local managed care company covering 750,000 New Jersey residents, Virtua, Adler Aphasia Center, helping stroke and brain injury survivors recover their speech, and by Cone Resnick Accounting Tax and Advisory, where forward thinking creates results. This is One on One. When you first heard that they were doing Charlie Rose and Gail King, didn't you go, what? People like laughing at others, so I don't mind if the other is me. See, you go right into the character. That's what it is. <laughs> I'm bringing families together a half an hour each week. Man, I'm doing something special. And so I do feel successful. Hi, I'm Steve, I'm Steve Adubato. I'll get that right. I've only been doing this 25 years. Hey, let me introduce uh, our good friend, Steve Masiello, men's basketball coach at uh, Manhattan College. The Jaspers, right? Jaspers, baby. You guys had a good year last year. We did. It was Describe a, it. It was a fun year. It was a year where very few times in life do you start the year with expectations um, of what you want to happen and what you expect to happen, and then it actually goes according to plan. And uh, we were really fortunate last year, and it's a credit to my staff and my student athletes. Just high character people across the board who get it, and, mm. and they understand it. They, they sacrifice, they put time in, and they got the reward, and we won a MAC championship, and we had the opportunity to go play Louisville in the NCAA, and uh, played them tough. Game. Yeah, great it, was it was a fun game. It was a great game to be a part of, yeah. um, and they were the, obviously defending national champion, my mentor, Rick Patino. And uh, we came out on the short end of I'm sorry, it. who was that, Rick Patino? Rick Patino. You might have heard of him. Where's he coach? Uh, Louisville. <laughs> University of Louisville. You might have heard of him. I've heard of him. Yeah. And, um, you know, he's a... He, Looking at just, a shot of you guys right there. Yeah. Yeah. It was just fun. It was just a fun, fun year. And uh, I really enjoyed it. And I got to meet your guys because my mentor, the chairman yeah. of the board of the Caucus Educational Corporation, Ray Ramucci, and... Um, the best. Right. And his son, Mike, Mike, who's on your staff. On my staff. Ray said to me, hey, because I do a little motivational yeah. speaking. You and, were great. Well, you were a big reason why we had success. Get out of here. You were. You came, came in, spoke to the team, got them on the straight and narrow, and after then, it was you made my job easy. Oh, yeah, right. That was it. <laughs> but it was, uh, the point I'm making is that meeting your guys off the court and seeing how together they were, how committed they were, and they hadn't been on a big run then. They had a good, right. they were doing all right. Right. But to see these guys, and describe who they are. These are guys that are mostly New York yeah. guys. They're, they're mostly inner city guys right. from the boroughs who were a little overlooked for whatever reason, didn't get the glory, didn't get the um, you know, media attention that maybe some guys got. They have a little bit of a chip on their shoulder in a good way. Right. They're hungry and humble, which is a great combination. Right. And what I love about them more than anything is they don't have ego, they have team ego. Mm. They understand their name is their brand and they, they represent that. And they take great pride in that. And it makes my job very, I have a very easy job because of the character of these guys. And so, so great things happen. And so everyone's uh, hot uh, after uh, Steve Masiello after this. So then a little incident goes on, right? Yeah, a little one. You heard about that? Yeah, I heard about it. So uh, the folks at South Florida say, hey, we want you. They offer yep. you, I think, a five-year deal, five yeah. million bucks. Yeah, say, uh, a little more. Little, OK, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> a little more. A little more. The big deal comes in. Yeah. And you struggle with it because you're committed to the Jaspers, but you take the deal. Yeah. And then a detail comes out that yeah. on your resume it says that you graduated from college yeah. when, in fact, that was not true. Correct. You did not know that? Correct. What happens? Greatest thing that ever happened to me. And Come on. I mean it. And, and I sit here because Winston Churchill says when, when going through hell, keep going. And, and it's so true. And it's, it, and it's changed. It's reprogrammed me. But we should take a step back. South Florida says, oh, wait a minute, time out. Right. We're out. You don't have a team yeah. for a period of time. Correct. You I'm know, I limbo. imagine you don't know what's going on. Yeah. The tabloids are all over you. Yeah. The Daily News, the Post, yeah. everyone else, yeah. right? I'm thinking, my friend Steve, he's struggling. Yeah. Right? All of a sudden, Manhattan yeah. says it, what? They bring me back. Go ahead. And, and what happened was I, I learned a great lesson in life. It was the, it was the worst 
78 days of my life. It was just, you know, it was really a tough time, not only for me, but for my family. And a detail that I missed at 21 years old almost cost me everything in my life at 36. And it totally changed my life. And I made an honest mistake. I thought I graduated. I wore a cap and gown. I participated in the commencement ceremony. I went to summer school. I thought I finished. I didn't, I missed some things. And it came out 15 years later that I missed something. And immediately Manhattan was phenomenal. They got behind me. They said, let's make this right. Let's get you back where you belong. Take care of your degree piece, and then let's get you, you had back. You had to go back and take team. care of school. I had to go back and take care of school right away. And I did that. And it took me about uh, two months to do that. I took care of what I needed to. And, and what it taught me, and it's a great teaching point for me, is what, to my guys, what you do now mm. could affect the next 30 years of your so life. So what you tell them? And that's exactly what I told them. I said, I made a mistake, an honest mistake, at your age. I said, it almost cost me everything I've worked for my whole life. It's put my family through a great deal of pain, seeing my mom, my girlfriend, my family struggle and go through these ups and downs with me and see me basically get you know, beat up pretty good in the media. Whether it's rightful or wrongful, it doesn't matter. That, that's the- You owned it? Absolutely, you have 100%? to. 100%? 100%. It's on me. On me. you? It's on me, 100%, on, no one else. What's the lesson there for your kids? No, your players? You have, to, you have to be more accountable yourself than anyone else. And, and if you want them, you can't assume anything. There's no gray area, it's black and white. I, I'm not gonna blame anyone. This is on me, this is Steve Masiello. My name is my brand, and I let my brand take a fall. And no one, that's not, who am I gonna point the finger to? Me, it's on me. So I should've done a better job at 21. That's right. The only issue I had was, everyone was saying, well, you preach all these things, you teach all these things, yeah, I do. If I was the same person I was at 21 that I am at 36, I wouldn't be a college basketball coach. I'd be doing something totally different, you know. But you're different because of those mistakes, absolutely. because of what you learn, because of maturity. A absolutely, and that's what it's about, you know. And, and I, I'm a big believer. I've preached to my guys: life isn't about how you do; it's about how you do under adversity. Mm. It's about how do you show what's your character. Your dad teach you that? Right? Absolutely. Let me show a picture of you and your dad. Yeah. You're tight. Oh, uh, my best friend. Describe. Um, he was a guy, and, and you know, Mike and I always laugh about this. Mike Bermucci. Yeah, yeah, and, and and Mike's dad is very similar like that to Mike. Whatever you went to him for. He, he made you feel the answer he gave you was the right answer. And it was something that was just really unique to me because he, he was insurance in my life. Whenever I needed something, whenever I needed a, a tough decision or an easy decision, he just, he, he, he didn't tell me what to do. He just kind of guided me on the right course. And he had a very subtle way, but a very powerful way about him. Um, him and I are just, you know, he was everything to me. Everything, and I lost him in uh, 2008. Will you still leave a seat on the bench for him? Yeah, yeah. You know, if he was here, he's so influential in my basketball. Grass is my mother, but my dad. And if he was here, he'd be sitting on the bench with me. So I leave the first seat in the bench. Um, and, and if you ever watch me coach, I'll turn to that seat a lot. And people <laughs> think I'm losing my mind because I'm asking questions to that seat, and I'm waiting for him to answer me back, you know, yeah. and, and tell me what to do. But he, he was, uh, he was my world. Before I let you out here, Steve, what do you love about coaching at Manhattan? the ability to impact people's life and make young people's life better. If we're not making people's life better. Steve, come on, it's basketball. No, it's not basketball, it's life. Basketball is secondary. It's life. Are you making someone's life around you better? If you're not doing that, you're not living. You have to really bring out the greatness of other people. What do those kids owe each other, in your mind? You know, I, I think what they owe each other is peer, good peer pressure. You see someone not doing the right thing, say it. Be a leader. Be a leader at a young age. Bring that out. Hold each other accountable. That's what it's about. It's easy to shut your mouth. It's easy not to say what's right. But if you can get young people today to talk and actually communicate, not text it, talk and say it, you know, you're getting them on the right, right course. And, that, and that's what it's about for me. I care more about in 20 years of my guys, where they're working, are they good husbands, are they good fathers, are they taking care of their family? That's what it's about. You love what you do. Oh, my God. Steve Masiello, men's basketball coach, Manhattan Jaspers. Get you some games this year. I'll be there. Great. You don't need me speaking. You're there. <laughs> Take care, buddy. Thanks, buddy. I appreciate it. Stay with us. We'll be right back right after this. That was great. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD, And follow us on Twitter at steveadubato. Listen, the whole range of uh, discussion and confusion as to the 
uh, Affordable Care Act, what it means, what it doesn't mean. But bottom line is people signed up, some other folks didn't, and there's going to be another period where people can do it again. And the gentleman who's sitting across from me knows more about this than just about anyone else. He is Dr. Joel Cantor, Distinguished Professor at Rutgers University's Center for State Health Policy. Joel, let me ask you, you're, you're sought out by people across this country to make sense of the ACA, otherwise known as Obamacare. Let's take a look back. The number of people who signed up, disappointed, satisfied, what? I think most folks are, are satisfied. Um, you know, of course, we were all worried when the website was failing. And, oh, were there uh, any problems there? I hadn't heard. You hadn't heard. <laughs> <laughs> a few, did a that few. really set us behind? Uh, it, it did, and, and it really undermined confidence uh, of the general public in, in this whole thing. Uh, if they can't get that right, how can they get the rest right? But remarkably, they, they solved the problems quickly once they brought in the, the, uh, the cleanup team. Uh, and, by, and in New Jersey, the number of people? Uh, so uh, 300,000 or so. Um, and, uh, you know, I think we, we hit the mark, so to speak. We did pretty well. In Medicaid, we did very well uh, in enrollment. Uh, in the new private plans through the marketplace, uh, we are at least on par with the rest of the country. So. But Joel, here's my question. What did people sign up for? Meaning, you and I were just talking right before we got on the air, and I said, yeah, it's great that so many people signed up, but I wonder how many people, when they signed up, knew exactly what they were signing up for, other than saying, I know it's better than not signing up and not having this coverage and having to pay the penalty. Go ahead. So, of course, we, we don't know yet. It's new, right? So um, people are just starting to use their plans. Uh, and when they find out that their doctor's not in the plan, uh, that might come as a shock to some. Uh, many of the plans have narrower networks of, of providers. They have higher cost sharing uh, than some of the old plans, um, different benefit structures. There's, there's a lot to navigate here. Is there something about New Jersey and, and our population with respect to health care delivery and the plan? Well, New Jersey is different from much of the rest of the country in, in a, lot of, a lot of ways when it comes to health care. So, for example, we have a lot more small practices, solo doctors, partnerships, than most of, that's beginning to change, but it changed more rapidly elsewhere. So making sure your doctor is in the network is, is, is sometimes a, a challenge. Otherwise, we're pretty much on trend uh, in terms of the structure, the kinds of plans that are, that are being offered. Is there a direct correlation between the hospital situation in the state, the number of hospitals, the type of hospitals, mm -hmm. and the Affordable Care Act and the implementation of it? Well, there's some national trends uh, that are occurring in New Jersey as well of hospitals consolidating hospital systems buying other hospitals. Uh, and and that, that's going on here as well. They're positioning themselves for the new incentives under the Affordable Care Act, and positioning themselves to negotiate uh, good rates with insurers, uh, positioning themselves to do better care. Uh, but you know, the, the other thing that we've been a part of, <clears throat> together with our colleagues in public broadcasting, WNET and NJTV mm -hmm. and others, is public awareness. And there's been, we've been very fortunate that there have been some very uh, generous, let's just say, and public-spirited foundations who have supported right. those efforts. Public awareness. I, I often wonder to what degree we in the media, not just in public broadcasting, but primarily public mm -hmm. broadcasting, because you won't see a lot of this on the commercial side. Mm -hmm. Unless there's a screw up, they'll be there right away to talk about how healthcare.gov yeah. doesn't work, right? right? But here's my thing. T to what degree can we truly educate the public about these massive changes going on in the healthcare world and what it means to them and what mm -hmm. people actually need to do. Is that our job, your job, the foundation, whose is it? Of course, it's all of our jobs. Uh, it's, it's particularly tough in New Jersey. I don't need to tell you the media markets here being centered out of state with you know, big media markets in New York and in Philly and the stories in those uh, states are slightly different than here. Uh, uh, newspapers being what they are these days with less readership, it's, it's really hard. Uh, but what would, be, what would be the message? Say there was a, the, a really effective public awareness campaign. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. would the message be? Well, the, the message is there's coverage available uh, for a lot of folks. Uh, there are discounts, subsidies uh, available uh, uh, that you need to pay attention to what you're buying. Um, working with Robert Wood Johnson Foundation, there's some polling data out that shows that people are in New Jersey are less confident about their knowledge about health insurance, basic health insurance terms, than national, the national average. That, that, that surprised us. Um, but uh, when you think about it, it's uh, perhaps due to the fact that we have more immigrants on average than the rest of the country, and the American healthcare system is unique in the world. 
Mm. Uh, and uh, uh, also people, lots of folks who are entering the insurance market for the first time. Give po folks a sense of the next opportunity people have to sign up for the ACA, the Affordable Care Act. So if you're very low income, say 15000 or less for a, a small family, uh, you can sign up any time through the Medicaid program. There's, there's no uh, open enrollment period sure. for that. Uh, if you're above that level uh, and you don't get insurance through your employer, uh, no, n the date to watch is November 15th. November 15th, 2000 and? This year, 14. 2014. Right. Uh, open enrollment opens again. You can go on healthcare.gov and get a, uh, get a plan. If something happens in your family, you lose a job, you lose insurance, a divorce, whatever, uh, and uh, then there, uh, there are opportunities to get in before then. It works really quite similarly to large employer plans where there's an annual open enrollment period uh, and you know, special circumstances, there are exceptions. And finally, for those who are watching saying, listen, I didn't have it before. I went to the emergency room. They took care of me. I don't mm -hmm. know what the big deal is. Mm -hmm. So what's the pressure well, to have to sign up again? You say. Well, uh, you never know what's going to happen. Um, and if everyone's vulnerable, can have a heart attack. Uh, and that can be financially ruinous. Uh, and the way health insurance is structured under Obamacare, uh, ACA, what have you, it really covers those catastrophic events very well. Uh, there are penalties if you don't sign up for most people, and those penalties start going up. You know, you've been a big advocate of this plan. Well, I don't know if I've been an advocate. I've been you, a critic you, as much as an advocate, I think. You've said that this needs to be done because the alternative of the status quo is not acceptable. You've said that. I have. Why is the status quo not acceptable, doctor? Well, the, uh, for people without good employer-sponsored health insurance, uh, unless you had a lot of money, you were just shut out. We had a huge affordability problem in this state. And that's in part because New Jersey did some of the things that the ACA is trying to do, uh, not, not allowing insurance companies to exclude people because they're sick. That drives up costs. The difference between our old system here, uh, where the cost just rose and rose, and the new system is that there's financial help available. That draws more people in, draws more healthy people in, keeps premiums more affordable. Dr. Joel Cantor from Rutgers, it's clear why people come to you to ask these important questions about the, uh, the issue of our time. Thank you so much, Joel. Thanks. To see more one-on-one -on -one with Steve Adubato programs, visit us online at steveadubato.org. If you would like to express an opinion, email us at info at caucusnj.org. Find us on Facebook at facebook.com slash PhD and follow us on Twitter at Steve Adubato. Maud Dami is the former president of the New Jersey State Board of Education. He's also an old friend. We knew each other in a different life. That's right. <laughs> Back in the 1980s, I was honored That's to right. be a member of the state legislature, and right. you were uh, with the NJA. Um, excuse me, you were no, part of with, the I was on Board the, of Education. On the State Board of Education. Board of Education, yeah. and we were talking about education issues, and we are doing this in cooperation with our partners with the NJA uh, Classroom Close-Up. You're about to see a, uh, a video of, of the work that Maud is involved in. You're also a Holocaust survivor, which is yes. the connection right. to this piece. And, and Maud and I, while we knew each other for a long time, I actually never knew this part of your story as a Holocaust survivor. Um, set this up real quick for us, what we're about to see. This video, that the classroom close-up video, talks about the work that you're doing in educating people. No, it, it's about a trip that I take every year that I lead. Is this um, to Berlin and Prague? Yes, and we go on. But NJEA classroom close-up joined us for five days and filmed the Berlin and the Prague part of this journey that we take every year with teachers. So you're partnering with the NJA to, to do this. They came to show this story. You're yeah. out there trying to educate people on the Holocaust, so right. we never forget. Mm -hmm. uh, Maud right. Dami is an extraordinary uh, person, born in the Netherlands, um, and was one of the Butch, Dutch hidden children who survived the Holocaust. She came to the United States at the age of 14, and she's been a giant in the field of education for many years. But you'll see why she's a giant here from our partners, the NJA, looking at classroom close-up right now. I think it, it'll be a wonderful experience. I know we don't all know each other. It's just amazing every year to see these groups just bond. 
Maud Dame recently invited this group of New Jersey educators to her home. She's preparing them for a seminar where they'll visit several Holocaust sites throughout Europe. I can see the impact it has on teachers. Maud has hosted this trip for over 10 years. Teachers teach it. They read up about it. They've seen films. They've had survivors in their classroom. But they have never actually been there to walk and smell and feel these camps. One hundred twenty were here in this cell, and this cell was Jewish cell, so were only the Jewish prisoners here. We can imagine... They had numbers, because this was also, they went out and worked, a labor camp, and also it really was a transit camp. You came in and you were shipped out. This trip provides educators with an unforgettable experience. And for Maud, it's also a personal one. She's a Holocaust survivor. It took me a long time to come to terms and be able to talk about it. And most of my family perished in Poland. So then I started speaking about it. And then I realized how important it is to share as a survivor my story with students. Maud and her younger sister were born in Holland, but at age six, her parents, with the help of the Dutch underground, sent both girls to live with a Christian family in a safe house. After the war, they were reunited with their parents, and by 1950, the family moved to New York City. Maud's story is chronicled in the 2006 PBS documentary, The Hidden Child. There were so many Jews hidden, adults as well as children, so that whole Maud has been featured numerous times on Classroom Close-Up so and continues to visit classrooms to, to share her story. They felt at the risk of their own lives, they would save us. Although she's not a teacher, Maud was a longtime member of the New Jersey State Board of Education and has always been an avid supporter of Holocaust education. I think then the teacher going back to the classroom, it's, it's just amazing from what I hear from them, how that has impacted them and how that has helped them in really understanding it much, much more. And of course, teaching to their students. They're the ones who really benefit from it too. It's overwhelming. You, know, you, you come in with a certain idea, um, you read about things, you see pictures, but when you get here and you see it firsthand, it becomes real. And that's what I want to take back to the classroom as well, is to hopefully make it more real for my students. What will become of all the memories? Are they to scatter with the dust and the breeze? But one thought gives me comfort. It's all I have left. I know that God and the children, they won't forget. We won't forget. Please don't forget. What are you thinking, Maud? <laughs> it takes me back to this trip just um, this summer. And um, it's, it's difficult even for me, even though I am in Poland two or three times a year going to the camps. But each time, it's not anything that one can get used to. But it was just wonderful to see um, the group, to be able to see and to feel uh, the camps and I think everyone we really don't know each other this year there were 32 teachers but we bond and we're family when we come back and we have shared so many memories we have laughed we have cried and everyone is a changed person once they come back after having done this journey how are they better teachers because I think they understand it. I mean, most teachers will have films and they have survivors in their classroom and all that, but to actually be there and to touch it and to, to feel it and to smell it, I think makes such an impression on them that they never forget. And I think, and then they're able to go into the classroom and really share this experience with their students. What do you think it's done for those children? Um, it's amazing because um, I got many letters after I speak from students. I'm sure. And I can tell by the letters they write that I've reached them. So it's, it's, so it's sometimes it's a little comical too because um, one particular teacher actually had a plan on the first paragraph thanking me, second paragraph what they learned from me, and third paragraph how they're going to use this knowledge. 
And it was very moving to see in how many ways they would use this knowledge. And then also, of course, one little boy wrote, now I don't like my brother, but I'm going to be very nice to him <laughs> from now on. So <laughs> you have those two. You know, I can't imagine what it must be like for you on two levels. One, as you talk about what you, what the experience is like going back, that's none of us can imagine that. But the other thing is having the impact that you've had. I mean, some of us can just imagine having one tenth of that impact. What is that like for you to know that you're having this impact? It's it, you know, it took me a long time to talk about it. I learned to speak English very well. No one would assume that I was foreign born. But in 1982, um, when Governor King created the Advisory Council on Holocaust, I decided the time had come I had to speak about it. It was very difficult at first. But it now um, it has helped me to come to terms with many things that I've experienced. But it also um, has made me such a better person, and I feel so much more, and how wonderful it is to be alive. I think is the most important thing. It doesn't matter what you have, but just to be alive. And I've learned a lot about myself, too, in the process, never thinking I would ever be on this journey. But I am. And I feel that um, everyone who hears our stories of the survivors benefits. Well, you know, it's one thing to know you back in the day in the legislature mm -hmm. while you're lobbying for certain issues and talking about education. But it's a very different thing to see you now and to know the impact you're having on teachers and children. And now, everyone watching on public television, we thank our partners at the NJEA and this great series, Classroom Close-Up. You are an extraordinary woman who is making a huge difference, and you honor us by being with us. Thank you, Maud. Oh, thank you so much. Thank you. One on One with Steve Adubato has been a production of the Caucus Educational Corporation, celebrating over 25 years of broadcast excellence. Funding for this edition of One on One with Steve Adubato has been provided by the New Jersey Education Association, Wells Fargo, Health Republic Insurance of New Jersey, Qualcare Inc., Virtua, Adler Aphasia Center, and by Cone Resnick. Promotional support provided by the Star Ledger, powering NJ.com, and by Commerce Magazine. Transportation provided by Airbrook Limousine, serving the metropolitan New York, New Jersey area. Some things were never meant to be cut. That's why when you have knee replacement at Virtua, we don't cut the quadriceps tendon. Because when it comes to getting you past chronic knee pain and on with your life, it's what we don't cut that counts. Visit gotmylifeback.org today.